I know of nothing in human experience more degrading, more dehumanizing, more devastating to the image of God than a man or woman in slavery. The history of America will always carry a dark stain of its days of slavery. A.C. Dixon one-time pastor of the famed Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London who followed uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said these words the greatest movements in the political world have been for the emancipation of slaves and that was back in the 1800s And as we speak this morning, slavery is still in the news. I heard several broadcasts just this week of slavery in the United States. Children, women, victims of sexual abuse in the underworld. And so it continues. People are also slaves sometimes without even knowing it. There are people who are running from the law right now. And they're hiding out. And in, a, in essence, they are already in a prison. Their lives are not free. They're sort of slaves to whatever crime they committed and they're running from the law. People who are addicted to alcohol or drugs or tobacco or 
for, uh, pornography or, or any of these devastating sins are slaves. People who are addicted to gambling or immorality are slaves to their bad habits. Uh, you cannot commit sin and master it. If you commit sin, it will master you. If you continue to live in sin, it masters you. And the history of slavery goes back 3,500 years before Christ in Mesopotamia, which is now modern Iraq. The first known slaves formed the lowest class of society in that area of the world. As far as we know, it, ex it has always existed in places like Assyria and Babylon and Egypt and Persia. So it's not just over here. Slavery was practiced in China. It was practiced in India. The trade of slaves and its history is, is enormous. I remember in Brazil, we heard stories all the time of ships that were bringing slaves from Africa. They would stop in, in Brazil and leave off a part of their slaves there. They're captured. And many times they would split up families, brothers and sisters, or sisters and, and brothers. They would mix them up, leave half of them in South America, Brazil, and then bring the rest of them up to the United States. And history shows that for many in this world, slavery has been a way of life. And those who have practiced it have even used scripture to, to defend it, even in our own country. But there have been great efforts for liberation. Abraham Lincoln, uh, William Wilberforce, Wendell Phillips are, are names that are associated with tremendous efforts to liberate the slaves. And the world is indebted to them. But greater than any movement for the liberation of slaves socially or politically is the liberating power of the cross. Because in essence, if you study the scriptures, at one time or another, we have all been slaves. We, before coming to Christ, were slaves to sin. And maybe our lives weren't all that bad, but still, uh, we had not been liberated from the power of sin. We had not been liberated from the devastation of sin and the consequences. If you commit sin... And you keep on and you don't do anything about changing it in your life, then it, it, it certainly masters you. I think we're all ruled or controlled by a master. I, I read a story of a motorist who was obviously in a big hurry. He parked his car and he parked it in the wrong place, but he put a note on it and it sl he slipped it under the windshield. And uh, the note said, I've circled the block for 20 minutes. I'm late for an appointment, and if I don't park here, I lose my job. Forgive us our trespasses. When he returned at the end of the day, he found another note under his windshield, and the note read, I've circled the block for 20 years, and if I don't give you a ticket, I'll lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. <laughs> well, we all answer to someone, don't we? We live for sin or we live for Christ. Living for self is, is living for sin. The Bible is, is very precise. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is an unrighteousness that only God can cure. I'll never forget the young woman who suddenly left her husband for another man. 
And she was confronted by her friends by, for what she had done. And her answer was, I'll probably burn in hell for this, but this is what I want to do. See, a rebellious spirit against God uh, enslaves us. It leads us down the wrong path. Somebody has said, whatever is not of faith is of sin. We, we have all witnessed people who live in the slavery of doubt. Or in the slavery of their habits or the slavery of their pleasures. And if something inside of you tells you that you are engaging in the wrong activity and you just consent, continue to persist in it, that is a sin. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it's a sin. And sometimes we get caught up in that, like that young lady. She knew what she was doing was wrong, but she wanted to do it anyway. Even said, I might burn in hell for it. Like, I don't care. Some people are controlled by power, others are by greed, some by ambition or lust, some by hate. Sin enslaves and it destroys. I want to talk about the liberation from sin that Jesus gives us. That's what we're thinking about this morning. As sin enslaves, Christ liberates. And as we focus back on that week, as he, he came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, under pomp and ceremony and the praise and hosannas of the people and everybody happy, and some people not even knowing who he was, asking, who is this? Then the week turned into a series of various ministries, which if you read those passages in the Gospels, it's, it's like parables taking place actually in alive and in reality as Jesus goes through a whole series of things that week. Cleansing the temple, ministering and healing, being with his disciples, having that supper, the horrible arrest in the garden, the false trials, all of this was taking place. But all of it was for liberation. Liberating you and me from the sins that beset us. The sins that keep us from being what God wants us to be. The sins that keep people out of e eternal life with God. Charles Wesley uh, said it best in a, in a hymn uh, that we often sing. He breaks the power of canceled sin. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God not only calls upon us to be controlled by love and forgiveness and grace. He calls upon us to be controlled by a, a loving desire to do good for others. And on our own good, on our own power, we don't do so well. But we are transformed and we are given the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us. As I was reflecting upon this uh, message this morning, I, I was thinking about all the tragedies that have taken place in church settings. All the people that have died, and we, I'm not even going to try to list the, those this morning but but you know what I'm talking about it's more and more and I remember one specific one that that shows more maybe than all the rest and, and on some of them have, have have shown it in one way or another but maybe more than all the rest the liberating power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the one I'm remembering this morning happened on October the 2nd, 2006, quite a time ago. 
But it happened in a special setting. At least we think it's a very special th setting. I have, a, I have a very special feeling for those people, and I enjoy visiting the area where they live. And I'm talking about the Amish people up in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. What I'm talking about happened at the little one-room schoolhouse, West, West Nickel Mines School. On that day, October the 2nd, 2006, a man by the name of Charles Carl Roberts IV walks into that little schoolhouse. He's a milk truck driver. He's a father of three. But he has been driven by evil forces all his life. And he is awfully confused. And he's awfully mad. And he goes into this little one room schoolhouse with Amish children and opens up gunfire, killing five young girls and wounding five others, and then turning the gun on himself. Doesn't that amaze you why? people who are so disturbed want to take so many other lives with them, so many innocent lives. What had those little children, those five-year-olds, not five years old, but those five little girls, what had, what had they done to deserve to be murdered in cold blood? They were ages seven to 13. Now, in some communities, this act of violence would have easily caused a whirlwind of hatred and violence. But in this Amish community, the greatest outpouring of forgiveness and love and grace was expressed. And I'm talking about even the parents who lost their children. The Amish people are strong in their faith in God. They're strong in their belief of eternal life. And with broken hearts, these Amish people started not only ministering to one another, but they even reached out to the distraught wife of the murderer, Charles. They reached out to him. And they even helped this family financially. And they made every effort they possibly could to teach those other children in that one school room schoolhouse not to hate, but to love and to forgive something as horrendous as the taking of these innocent children's lives and the wounding of others. I tell you this morning, that's liberating love. That kind of love, that kind of reaction can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives through people of strong faith. And to some extent, just a few years ago, it happened in Charleston, South Carolina, too, but among adults. As we are all, or have been at one time or another, slaves, slaves to sin or slave to some habit, I have to close with this story. A slave was once purchased by an Englishman. Once the purchase was made, the Englishman immediately gave the slave his freedom, handed him a sizable amount of money, and told him to go with it and to live his life of freedom. You are now free to make any choice you want to make. The slave looked at that money. He looked at the Englishman. And he said, sir, are you saying 
that I can now do as I please? And the English says, absolutely. You are a free man. You can do as you please. Well, he said, if that is so, I'd like to go with you. And I'd like to be your servant the rest of my life. You know, you think about it. Jesus died on the cross for us. And he said, you're free. You can do as you please. You can go where you want to go. You're free to make any choice. And how wonderful it is if we say, you really mean that? I'm free? Then, sir, I would be pleased to go with you the rest of my life and serve you. I think that's a picture of Christianity. I think that's a picture of the liberating grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And on this Palm Sunday, as we think about the liberation that the cross has brought to us, it puts us in the mood to think about the resurrection and what that does. God bless us as we think about these things. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. It is number 302, I Hear Thy Welcome Voice. We're going to sing the first and the last stanzas. And if there's a decision that any of you would make this morning, this is the time to do it. And we ask you to come forward as we sing these two verses. May we stand.